Hi, I'm actor Ian Champion, and welcome to History of Horror Cinema, my personal podcast tour of the good, bad, and the ugly of horror movie history. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe. The Magic Christian, 1969 after their fractious relationship during the making of Casino Royale in 1967, Peter Sellers and director Joseph McGrath teamed up again with another friend of Sellers, writer Terry Southern, to bring to the screen an adaptation of Southern's novel The Magic Christian, with additional dialogue by John Cleese and Graham Chapman, whose appearing scenes were all that was left of their own draft. It's a mad, slightly psychedelic curio with some amusing cameos, albeit essentially a string of episodic sketches. I include it here as it features a good sport Dracula cameo by Christopher Lee, who was in the middle of the string of diminishing returns Dracula sequels for Hammer. Most recently, Dracula has risen from the grave the year before. In The Magic Christian, Sellers plays Sir Guy Grand, a stupendously wealthy man with a strong streak of mischief. At that time, Sellers was riding high on a career of enormous financial success himself. He was under no illusions, though, about the entrapment of greed. I've always been aware of the power of money, he once said, the way they wave it in front of you to get you to do things. His close friend, Spike Milligan, observed that Sellers consciously made the magic Christian to express what he thought about the human race in a commercial film, though Milligan added that he might not have been so self-aware of his own reflection. The whole thing could have been written about Peter instead of for him. His character, Sir Guy Grand, meets Ringo Starr, a young homeless man in the park, and immediately fills a gap in both their lives by making him his son, renaming him Youngman Grand and beginning his education. They then play out a series of crazy ideas on society that illustrates Sir Guy's theory that people will do anything for money. However, rather than become cynical or smugly moralizing, the film is at times playful fun if you accept its loose structure and the kind of illogical plot jumps that you experience in a dream. The first thing they do is enjoy a night out at a theatre performance of Hamlet, where Lawrence Harvey, as the Dane, inexplicably begins a strip tease during To Be or Not To Be, accompanied by stripper music. The film also contains many British actor cameos, as well as fleeting TV personality appearances from the time, such as Michael Aspel, Harry Carpenter and Alan Wicker. Grand schemes are wheezes and practical jokes rather than lectures. On board a train, he shows young men some fun at the expense of a man he claims profits from man's inhumanity to man by staging a hugely elaborate prank involving a fellow Japanese compartment traveler being repeatedly substituted via a revolving wall. As the intended victim grows more confused, he is dragged back through a sliding wall into the hallucinogenic experience of being photographed by Sellers as a cackling nun complete with wimple. This leaves the man a gibbering, mind-altered wreck. Not all the japes succeed as harmless fun, though. One grand stunt, involving a news report of a jungle cat being passed off as a Congo black dog at the Crufts show, starts out as madcap tasteless fun, but then McGrath suddenly jump cuts to the infamous real snuff footage of the South Vietnamese general shooting a suspected communist through the head during the Vietnam War. Using this moment of grisly reality is a terrible error of judgment in a comedy film. Inexplicable whether or not he was aiming for some kind of Bunuel-style shock juxtaposition. It takes a while to recover from that ruinous tonal shift. Later, there is a strangely fizzled-out payoff to a promising sequence where Grand, the celebrated gourmet, is strapped into a harness in his favorite restaurant, Une Chaise Gastronomique almost prefiguring Python's Mr. Creosote. But after comically smearing his face with sturgeon, the scene seems abruptly curtailed without a big finish. There are more amusing vignettes perpetrated by Grand and his son as the magic Christian goes on. We witness a gloriously lunatic duck hunt, where tank barrages are brought into play to wage full-scale air battle upon the flying ducks, simply because they can. A much-anticipated title fight in the boxing ring turns into a snog fest between the two pugilists. Spike Milligan makes a welcome cameo as an irascible traffic warden, clearly corpsing at the start, who is bribed with £500 to eat his issued parking ticket. He does so, and here is one of the few plot points where Grand actually states a purpose to his mischief-making. I just wanted to see if you had your price. Most of us do. 
This stunt, like one or two others in the movie, at least offers the type of vicarious wish fulfillment that money could buy, if you had enough of it. One of the best scenes is where the Grands attend an art exhibition to cause mayhem, surely a deserving target, and get the better of a snob expert John Cleese, who instead of being driven to his trademark wonderful apoplexy, is shell-shocked into a pleasing against type submission by the offer of £30,000 from Grand for an unauthorized Rembrandt. Shit, he meekly swallows. Sellers thus takes out a pair of scissors and to Cleese's shock cuts out a nose from the canvas, as this is all he wants from the work. He then attends the bidding with Youngman, for me the funniest sequence in the film, as he tries to distract the auctioneer with increasingly frantic props, such as an Aldis lamp, semaphore flags, a parping klaxon horn, and an Inspector Gadget-style extendable hand. Cleese's comedy writing partner and fellow python Graham Chapman also appears in a short scene spoofing the Oxford-Cambridge boat race, where Grand bribes the Oxford crew, managed by Sir Richard Attenborough no less, into ramming their opponent's vessel. Chapman is amused by the offer, and it's nice to see him underplaying in a straight part as Cleese does. Eventually, we understand the title of the film when the Grands board the luxury cruise liner that the movie title is taken from. Here the action descends into incomprehensible but amusing nonsense. How could it do otherwise with Wilfred Hyde White as the ship's captain? Raquel Welsh makes a fetching, scantily clad priestess of the whip in charge of rowing gallery slaves. And here is where Christopher Lee's Dracula pops in. Essentially, he morphs from a chilling waiter, frightening an imperious passenger, into the full splendid flowering of the Prince of Darkness in fangs and cape. Sadly, in Sir Christopher Lee's autobiography, he never mentioned how this part offer came about. Perhaps he, like many showbiz people, was a friend of Peter Sellers. In his book, he pays tribute to Sellers as a considerable actor and impersonator, after being mistaken for him by a very bad-tempered member of the public in a lift. Or perhaps the offer of a well-paid guest appearance in a Peter Sellers comedy was enough for him to overcome the increasing frustration he had at the alarming drop in quality of his most famous iconic character's sequels. Roman Polanski is serenaded by an oddly familiar masculine lady who I suddenly guessed as Yul Brynner just before he de-wigs. For a laugh, show this bit to a friend and see how long it takes them to recognize him. A gorilla runs amok and the journey concludes. Towards the end, Grand hammers home the point about greed overriding all other motives by creating a pool filled with human filth and banknotes and advertising it as free money. Sure enough, bowler-hatted city gents are only too happy to wade in at the chance of free lucre, a metaphorical foreshadowing of today's distaste at such avarice still going on. In an epilogue, Grand and Son take to the park where the father met his adopted son. Rand suggests this may be a more direct way to influence the people. He ends the movie, proving this once more by bribing the park keeper with a bundle of cash to leave them alone. The Magic Christian only works sporadically for a few of its comic scenes, which are worth the wait. It does suffer, though, from an incoherent, self-indulgent throughline, a manifesto that's never clearly sustained and, I might add, a waste of Ringo Starr, whilst Sellers seems to enjoy wafting through in a cut-glass accent as a twinkly lord of misrule, Starr's young man never develops as a character, which is a missed opportunity. He has a natural, offbeat charm on screen, which is cannily why the Beatles always gave him central roles in their films, but here he merely agrees with his adoptive dad, existentially echoing or commenting as they go along. Overall, the magic Christian isn't magic, but check your brain at the door and enjoy the illusions that work. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit subscribe.